Hello again, welcome back to Asgard, and welcome back to the fourth episode of our IC2 Classic Mod Spotlight series. So, this episode we are going to be focusing on power transfer, power storage, transformers, charge pads, and pretty much anything that relates to storing up power and, what, and transferring power and whatnot. So, originally this was planned to be part of the power generation episode, but due to the amount of stuff that we had to cover, I had to split this into a second part. So, let's go ahead and get started. Let's just really quickly touch on cables. You have a few different cable options within IC2 Classic. First up, you have your ultra low current cable. This can only transfer 5 EU per packet, but it does have a very low energy loss of just 0 0.025 EU. So in a situation where you're only generating 5 EU or less, for example, your solar panels, your very bottom tier solar panels, you can use this ultra low current cable because you're actually gonna lose less energy transferring with that than if you were to use copper cable, which has an energy loss of 0.2. And then next up you have your copper cable, which you have uninsulated and insulated. Now the main difference between uninsulated and insulated is that if you insulate it, you get 0.1 less EU lost per block space. And what that means, by the way, is whenever you have energy loss, basically, if I have energy and it moves from this point to this point, it's going to lose 0.2 EU, in this case, by traversing this cable. So every block space that it moves, it's going to lose 0.2 EU. And that's true of regardless of how many packets are transferring across this, each of those packets are going to lose 0.2 EU for every block space that they move when they're going through this copper cable. Also just bear in mind that any time that EU is transferred down a cable line, it's going to have to at least get one EU to actually lose anything. So for example, gold cable, when it moves one block space, you know, it's it has a loss right here of 0.5 EU. So if it moves between something here and something here, so let's say it moves like that. Okay, it's not going to lose any power going from this bat box to this bat box because it's only losing 0.5 EU and there is no fractions within IC2. So then if I was to remove that and I put another cable here and had it running down this line, now it's moving two block spaces. So it's going to lose one EU. Okay, and then if I then went on to send it over to here, it's still going to lose one EU. But then on that fourth block, now it's losing two EU. So just an example you know, it's going to have to have a full number. It's not going to be able to use any kind of fractions or anything like that. So just bear that in mind. And since we're talking about insulation and cables right now, let's quickly cover the insulation cutter. Um, this is a basic tool, very, very easy to craft. And what you can do is if you have copper cable that's insulated, you can left click it and pull the rubber off of it. So now this is uninsulated copper cable. Then if you want to, you can just right click it with rubber in your inventory and then you can insulate it. So basically it gives you a way just in the world to actively change your cables over if you want them insulated or uninsulated. And bear in mind that the copper cable is LV cable. Its max limit is 32 EU. So if you transfer higher than that, you're going to damage and destroy the cable. So make sure whenever you're connecting this stuff that you don't connect too high of power to this. So for example, if I come outside here, I'll show you what happens whenever you run too much power through a cable. So I've got a creative energy source here. So right now we're transferring 122 EU per packet and we're trying to transfer it through copper cable. So that's what happens. Your copper cable just burns up and is destroyed because you're trying to transfer way too much power through a very low tier cable. So just make sure that your cable is correct for the type of power that you're wanting to transfer. So in this case, copper cable only accepts up to LV. 32 EU per tick. Now next up we have the gold cable. You have gold, you have insulated, and then you have two times insulated. And you can see that between each of these there is a 0 0.05 change for each layer of insulation. So you've got 0.5 energy loss, 0 0.45, and 0.4. And gold cable is MV cable. It can transfer up to 128 EU. Now this can transfer the lower tier power. So if you wanted to, you could transfer LV, but bear in mind that this cable does have an energy loss of 0.4, whereas copper cable only has an energy loss of 0.2. So in this case, going with gold cable, you're actually going to lose out on more power when you try to run LV through it. 
Now, in addition to gold cable, you have another type of MV cable, and that is bronze. Bronze is not nearly as good, but it might be a little bit cheaper, and you may have to go with it if having trouble finding gold or something like that. And basically, it can transfer 128, just like the gold, and it has a 0 0.7, 0 0.65, and then 0 0.6 energy loss for the different stages of insulation. Now, next up, we have HV cable. This is HV level. It transfers 2048 EU, and you can see it goes all the way up to four times insulated. So energy loss goes from 1 to 0.95 to 0.9 and then to 0.8 for full insulation. So lastly, you get up into the really high quality cable. First up, you have glass fiber cable. This can conduct up to 512 AU, and it only has an energy loss of 0.025. So it actually has the same energy loss as that ultra low current cable. So when it, once you can get glass fiber cable, it's highly suggested that you do once you have access to a surplus of diamonds. Now one thing I do want to point out on here is there's a couple different ways that you can craft this. You can either use redstone or you can use silver. And silver is going to give you a bit more fiber cable. So if you have access to silver, I do highly suggest it because silver is not something that's used in a ton of things. And this is very, very useful to get that extra boost from your diamonds, especially early on, you don't have a surplus of diamonds, but you're probably gonna have a surplus of silver. And then the king of all cables, we have the plasma cable. It can conduct 32,768 EU, which is absolutely massive. And it has an energy loss of 1.5 EU. So unless you're actually sending a ton of power, plasma cables, you're gonna lose a lot of power transferring through the plasma cable. And this thing has a cost equal to its conductor energy limit. It is very expensive. You'll understand once we get up to the plasma cores how to craft those. They are crazy expensive. So just be ready. Those things are, are very late game cables. And then lastly on the topic of cables, we have the EU detector and the EU splitter. So what the EU detector does is it actually outputs a redstone signal any time that energy passes through it. So for example, I set a bat box right here, and I set a bat box over here, and just connect that up with copper cable. And by the way, the EU detector and the EU splitter, they can conduct up to 2048 EU with an energy loss of 0.5. So just a heads up on that. But if you have a bat box here and you throw in, say, a battery, and let's go ahead and rotate this bat box... You can see that a redstone signal comes out of this because energy is now moving through this EU detector over to this other bat box. And that's basically how the detector works. And then the EU splitter will actually turn itself off anytime it receives a redstone signal and will disconnect itself from the power line. So for example, let's connect this up and start sending power over to this. So power's coming in just fine, no problem. But let's go ahead and hit this with redstone. You'll notice that now it disconnects itself from the bat box and the copper cable and power ceases to transfer from these bat boxes to this one. And that's basically how the EU splitter and detector work. So now we've talked about power generation and we've talked about power transfer. Now let's talk about power storage. So first up we have the bat box. This is the LV power storage block. Maximum output is 32 EU per tick. If you feed it higher, if you input higher, then 32 EU per tick, it will explode, so do not do that. It has a 40,000 EU internal storage, and there's a couple slots here, and most of this information is true for all the power storage blocks, so I'm gonna move fairly quickly through the rest of these. So first up, if you have a full battery or something with power, you can put it in the bottom slot, and it will drain the power from that item. So in this case, it's pulling all the power out of the battery and putting it into its internal buffer. And then if you take something that can accept power, in this case, another battery, we put it in the top slot, it's actually going to pull power from its internal storage and put it into the energy accepting block. You can also emit redstone from these. So you can emit when the bat box is full. You can emit if it's partially filled, half or more filled, half or less filled, or if it's empty. So this is all redstone emission. So it can emit redstone. You can see right up there, it's a power of 15 from the bat box. But... Right here, you can actually have it so that whenever it receives a redstone signal, it will not output energy, or you can have it so that whenever it receives a redstone signal, it will not output any energy unless it's full. And then the last thing to note about the bat box and all generators moving forward is you're going to have one slot that basically has a circle here, and the rest of these are going to be blank. So what it means is the ones that are blank means that these sides can accept energy. There's going to be five blank sides, and then there's going to be one side with the circle. The circle side is the side that can output energy. 
So basically you can feed energy into this from five different directions, then you can output energy through one central line. Next up you have the MFE. This is the medium voltage. It can accept and output 128 EU per tick and can store 600,000 EU. Then you have the MFSU. This is the HV power storage. It can input and output 512 AU per tick, and it can store up to 10 million AU. Now bear in mind that you can actually feed LV power into the MFA or the MFSU. That's not a problem, and it will upscale that power. So you don't have to run your power through a transformer before you send it into your power storage blocks. You only have to transform power if you're downscaling it. You can't pump HV power into an MFE. You're going to have to downscale that through a transformer first. And then last up we have the PESU. This is the top tier. It can input and output 32,768 EU per tick, so a plasma cable's worth. And it can store lots of zeros. It's 1 billion EU that can be stored within a PESU. And just as a side note, you do have a creative energy source in this. You can set how much EU per packet you want to send out and your max packets. The creative energy source is merely a creative tool for testing machines. Now next up, let's really quickly talk about transformers. Let's run through these. First up, when you set them down, you're going to see that five sides have small circles and one side has three circles together. Basically what this is, is the three circles together is where you're going to input higher voltage power and the smaller circles are going to output lower tier power. So in the example of the LV transformer, you're going to input on this side here, 128 EU per tick, it can accept MV power, and then from these five smaller sides, it's going to output 32 EU. And you can see that it can output four packets per tick. Okay. Also bear in mind that if you give these transformers a redstone signal, that your higher voltage side is still going to be for the higher voltage, and then your lower voltage sides are still going to be for the lower voltage. So instead of these outputting LV, they are then going to input LV. And this side here, instead of inputting MV, it's going to output MV. Now bear in mind that the most that you can insert into this is 128 EU. Do not try to feed it HV power or anything over 128. And if you apply redstone to a transformer, what's going to happen is it's actually going to invert the process. So instead of taking in high voltage power and pumping out lower voltage, instead it's going to take in lower voltage and pump out the higher voltage. So in this case it would take in LV power, 32 EU per tick, and it would pump out 128 EU per tick. So just bear that in mind when you're using transformers. So we've covered the LV transformer. Next up we have the MV transformer. Basically this one takes in HV and converts it into MV. So 512 to 128 or vice versa if given a redstone signal. Then next up you have the HV transformer. Basically this takes EV power and transforms it down into HV. So 2048 to 512 or vice versa if given a redstone signal. Then you have the EV transformer which takes insane voltage and turns it down into extreme voltage power. So 896 to 2048. And then finally you have the insane voltage transformer. This takes the ultra insane super crazy power of 32768 and transforms it down into 8096 or vice versa if given a redstone signal. And then lastly you have the adjustable transformer. Now what this does, you can actually set up to 32 packets per tick. So you can send out 32 packets of power per tick with this is instead of the four that you can send with the rest of these transformers. And you're also able to open this up. It has its own GUI and you can set how much EU per packet is going to come out of this. So if we wanted to, we could convert um, even IV power down into LV power. So this can pretty much take any voltage of power and convert it to whatever other voltage that you want coming out of this. Now lastly, we have some different charge pads as well as um, the battery station. So let's just briefly go over these. So basically you have four different types of charge pads. You have static, which is LV, crystallizer, which is MV, lapatronic, which is HV, and fission, which is EV. Okay, so we'll go ahead and throw all of these down. And if we click on these, you can see they have a nice little GUI in here. And the static charge pad, this is the LV one. You can see it outputs 32 EU per tick, energy tier one. And there's a few different slots in here. Now, some of these are upgrades we're going to get into during the upgrades video. We'll cover out, we'll cover how to use all of these upgrades and stuff. But what we can do is we can put a battery in there 
get a little bit of power built up in that. So then if we come over here and we stand on this, I've got an empty battery at the moment, you'll see that it pulled the charge from this battery and put it into this battery. Okay, now by default, it only charges things within your armor slots and whatever you're currently holding in your hand. But there's upgrades that can change that and boost it that we'll get into. Also, these charge pads, if you have stuff within your bobble slot that needs charging, it will charge those. IC2C does have a lot of integration support for bobbles, and you can actually wear some of your, like, later on your batteries and stuff like that. You can wear them in your bobble slot, and we'll get into that a bit more whenever we cover the tools section. Then you also have the crystallizer, which is the medium voltage. You know, it's pretty, pretty standard. There's the HV one. There's the MV one. Now you'll notice as it goes, initially these are locked, right? And then you get a few more slots here, you get a few more slots after that. Now in a full fission charge pad, you can see that there's six different slots in this, right? This one is for a battery. These middle slots are for upgrades, which we'll get into upgrades and how they can affect charge pads and stuff like that. During the upgrades video, right here, this is a range upgrade. So you can actually increase the range on your charge pads to make them have a larger radius. And then lastly, you have a modifier upgrade. So for example, I'm not going to cover all of these right now. We're going to cover these in the upgrade section because I know this video is already getting a bit long. But for example, if you have the armor priority module, what it's going to do is it's going to actually charge up your armor first. And then once that stuff's charged up, then it will charge up, you know, whatever you're holding or whatnot. So basically, there's a few different things like that where you can kind of set how you want these charge pads to act when people stand on them. Now also something to note, if you, let's say you had a static charge pad and you wanted to upgrade it, instead of having to craft a crystallizer charge pad, what you can do is you can actually make this crystallizer upgrade kit. And then what we can do with this kit is we can just right click the charge pad. Now there's also a Lapatronic one and you can right click it. Now you can right click anywhere with, on this. And then the fission upgrade kit, there we go. So you can see bottom side, top, all that stuff works. You can click wherever and upgrade these. Now with these, you cannot skip tiers. You actually have to do these in order. So if you started with a static, you couldn't immediately throw a fission upgrade kit on it and turn it into a fission one. You're going to have to go crystallizer, lapatronic, and then fission. Now another note before we finish up with charge pads is if you place four charge pads and you stand in the middle of these, you will actually get charged from all four of the charge pads. So let's say, for example, I put down some fission charge pads here and you can see that my legs need charging. So if I was to stand in the middle of these, you'll see all of these activate. My quantum suit leggings are getting charged at a fairly good rate. And keep in mind that all of these can accept upgrades. They can actually accept overclockers and stuff to speed them up. And so if you have four fully upgraded fission charge pads, you can actually feel the charge on your equipment extremely fast. And this way you don't have to throw anything into you know, into the PESU to charge it one at a time or anything like that. You can just come over, stand on this, and get everything charged at once. Now, last up, we have the battery station. This is the final block that we're going to cover today, and this is actually a really cool block. What you can do, well, let's say as an example, we have this battery station. Let's throw Lapatron crystals in here. So basically, its power level is dependent upon batteries that are placed in it. And what we can do is there's a few different modes here. You have charging bench, you have battery station, that box. And so basically just a quick rundown of what the three modes mean. Charging bench mode means that it's only going to accept power. You cannot pump power out of it. So for example, if I put down, say, an MFSU in front of it, okay, you'll notice it's not, it's not sending any power at all to this MFSU. Then next up you have battery station mode. Basically what battery station mode is, is it means that it's going to drain power from this, but it's not going to accept power. So it's only going to it's only going to discharge power, basically. And then lastly, you have bat box mode. That means that it's going to accept power, for example, from this creative energy source, and it's going to send power out, for example, through this MFSU. All right, I've got an MFA plugged up to this now, and I'm going to show you the energy modes. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw a... Let me change it back to charging bench mode. So charging bench mode, of course, it's not going to send any energy to this MFA. It can still accept energy, but it can't send energy. But, so let's go ahead and change this over to battery station mode. You'll notice it starts draining back power from the first battery. That's low energy mode. It's going to drain from the first one. Now, if we hit high energy mode, it's going to drain enough from these.
to send out, it's going to equally drain from all the batteries to send out the next tier of power, whatever we're sending out. So MV power in this case. And then if we hit packet energy mode, basically it's going to send one packet per tick from each battery. So basically just keep in mind, low energy is going to be the lowest tier of these batteries. So RE batteries, of course, that's going to be LV power, right? That's all they can really send out is LV power. So it's going to pull probably from one battery. If it needs a little bit extra or something, something happens from like the second battery, it can do that. But for the most part, it's going to pull, you know, from the first battery. Then if you kick it over to high energy mode, then it's going to try to upscale that power. So in this case, these are LV. These are tier one, energy tier one. So it's going to try to upscale that to MV. Okay. But if I put Lapatronic crystals in here, it's going to try to upscale it to tier four. And then the energy mode, once again, is just, it's going to try to pull one packet of energy every tick from every battery and send that out. So basically you're sending... You know, you could end up sending, if you wanted to, nine batteries worth of power. Nine packets of 32EU, in this case. Now, in addition, you'll also see that we have a specific draining time. In this case, it's 30, you know, 38 seconds. This is only because we have negative amount of power coming in. We don't have anything coming in, but we're sending power out. So, if we were to put, you know, say, a creative energy source, you can see... If I set it to box mode, for example, and I have this, right now I have this set up to 120 EU per packet. Basically, it's pulling all that energy. It can pull, since I've got four batteries in here, it can accept MV power, okay? Because these are all tier ones. Now, of course, if you use Lapatronic crystals, then you could accept, you know, more power. Basically, you just, if you have enough batteries to accept MV power, then you can accept MV power. It's not a problem. You can see this MFE is charging right now. But there's no timer for drain time or anything like that. So basically what happens is, right now we're getting equal flow to what we're putting out. So it's actually not going to pull all that much. Okay. Then lastly, one thing I want to show you before we stop talking about battery stations. If you have, say, the Lapatron crystals, you can see right here, the output on high energy is 2048. And then low energy is 512. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention so you kind of know how the battery station works. It's pretty useful. Also, one thing to note, whenever this is charging, it's going to prioritize the thing in the first slot and then go down the line in that order. So, if our second, third, fourth. So, if you want to throw armor or something like that in there, you know, put it in the first slot. Because you can put armor or anything with a charge in here and it will charge up if it's connected to a power source and it's getting power. So, just bear that in mind. But anyways, that's pretty much got energy transfer, energy generation, energy storage, all of that taken care of. We're done with that. Awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, as always, be sure and hit that like button. Go ahead and subscribe if you're not already to stay up to date with when new videos come out. Be sure and check out the mod. It's down below in the description. There'll be a download link down there. So be sure and check it out if you guys are interested. And I hope to see you guys next time. Next episode, we're going to start working with machines and actually using some of this power that we're generating. So fun, fun stuff. I hope to see you guys then. Until then, as always, do take care, stay safe, and I will see you guys next time.